Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the panel about fake news and social media. Uh, is it the new propaganda? And uh, this is the second year we've had this panel. And I mention it because uh, last year when we had it, it was before the election. And uh, we all know what happened with that, and we're all probably familiar uh, with the issues that have gone on with the Russian hacking. Um, but that's just really one, one recent example of kind of what we're going to talk about today. Um, which is the emergence of sort of a reemergence of propaganda, the use of social media to influence uh, societies, public opinion, uh, and outright hacking to change what should be a democratic process. So for those of you who don't know, um, the intelligence agencies have come forward and said that Russia has basically uh, hacked or attacked our election in multiple ways. And I just read the reread the uh, report that they produced, the summary, uh, the other day, and uh, it was a multi-pronged sort of attack, really, um, through stations such as RT with their biased coverage. Uh, who in here is familiar with RT? I used to watch RT actually. <laughs> I used to watch RT, and I've watched Alex, jo Alex Jones extensively, uh, more out of a curiosity and just kind of like a in a way to study uh, the mentality of that kind of thing. And um, there's been a real emergence uh, from the alt-right. Uh, I don't want to restrict it to the alt-right, but um, from that kind of perspective, um, and it's bringing in a lot of Cold War type of propaganda, but it's, it's new and it's different because now we have a lot of social media. Um, one of the findings that the intelligence agencies made was that the Russian government had hired bots uh, to basically uh, promote stories that are adverse to Hillary Clinton, and then uh, they abstained from releasing any information that harmed uh, Donald Trump. Um, also another strategy, another way they, they attacked the election was to um, uh, release information, uh, essentially laundering it through WikiLeaks. Um, WikiLeaks, of course, claims to not know the sources of their, uh, the sources of their source, I guess to put it, the identity of their sources. Uh, but nonetheless, the intelligence agencies have concluded that uh, with a strong probability that the information came from the Russian government or at the direction of Vladimir Putin. So um, with that, I'd just like to have the panelists introduce themselves and we'll get started. If any of you have any questions at any time, just feel free to raise your hand. Hi, everybody. My name is Amy Stepanovich. I am U.S. Policy Manager at Access Now, which is an international group working on the intersection of technology and human rights. Um, we got involved, well, we've been involved in um, issues of propaganda and censorship, which is what fake news touches upon for quite some time. Um, but this January, we actually put out a FAQ guide on quote unquote fake news. Um, because one of the things we wanted to demonstrate is that this is not a new issue by any means. It's been around um, basically as long as journalism has been around in the, in the US and longer. Um, it used to be called yellow journalism, where people would exaggerate things. Um, it has kind of evolved. I don't know if maybe, you know, around the time that people were getting online, you would see chain letters and things come in your inboxes, I imagine. Yeah, maybe. I'm seeing nods of stories that were just blatantly false. Um, I remember early 90s or late 90s when Snopes was around and everybody was like, why didn't you check that on Snopes? <laughs> Um, when it really emerged as kind of a powerhouse fact checker. Um, so this isn't anything revolutionary, um, what happened. Um, what's interesting more so is the response to the idea that these stories are getting shared more and more frequently. Because one of the things, I mean, there's a lot of things to talk about, but I think one of the more interesting things is what it ignores. Um, so first of all, there's a spectrum of fake news. Um, and this will be the topic I introduce and then turn over. Um, it's not just a thing that is it fake news or is it not fake news. Um, there are the blatantly, patently created from thin air um, stories um, that are put online ostensibly what people have shown in order to um, generate ad revenue for the people running the websites. Most of the time these don't have political motivations. They have monetary motivations, um, much like people have had since the beginning of time. Um, some of them have been run out of Macedonia. Is that right? Macedonia, I believe yeah. Macedonia. Um, they've been tracked back. NPR did a great segment tracing one of them to um, a house in, Cal uh, in California, a single guy doing it. It's kind of interesting. It's almost entirely a profit margin for these 
patently false stories. Then there are the like fact-based news stories that you would say have only facts, have no editorial content whatsoever. All of those facts are verifiable and verified, and they are patently just objective news. And so if you think of those as the two sides of the spectrum, there's a lot of stuff in the middle of that. Um, there are clickbait headlines. How many of you have clicked on a clickbait headline in the last six months? <laughs> I did it this morning. <laughs> I'm not kidding. It was a list of the best Marvel movies ranked. They put Spider-Man 2 as number one, which means the list is clearly fake news. But um, Clickbait headlines are kind of a form of fake news. They're not really reflective of the content that you're getting. Um, they exaggerate things. They are trying to pull things out of proportion. And you're not going to get the content that you're looking for when you click on them. Um, another one of my favorite things, and I don't say this to pick on Breitbart, but it's a really interesting case study to me. So please if people pick follow, on Breitbart, please. if people follow <laughs> Breitbart, I don't want this to get political because I think both sides of the aisle really hit on it. But there was a story from Breitbart that said that um, Trump won the majority of voters in America's heartland. Did anybody see this news story? I thought this was a fascinating news story because the Washington Post went back in and they were like, "Okay, we'll give it to you." But how did you define that? And they actually were able to figure out how Breitbart was defining America's heartland. And it essentially included um, counties in Southern California and in Nevada and places. And I think what it came down to is every county Trump won, Breitbart was defining as America's <laughs> heartland to say that they won the majority of, he won the majority of voters there, which is really, really interesting. They weren't saying anything in their world that was false, they were just redefining commonly understood terms to mean something that the average reader might not think that they meant. Um, the reason why this spectrum is so important is because when you start talking about regulatory approaches or statutory approaches to dealing with fake news, um, it's really easy to do like one side or the other, but you know, at this side, it's not going to do a lot because you're not getting a lot of the political stories that people are caring about right now. On this side, you're not going to regulate that, of course. How do you define that middle term in a legal way? It really starts to look like um, subjective, biased interpretations, which will get into censorship. And that's not what we want to legislate, I think, by any means. Um, and what we're seeing are a lot of proposals coming out of Congress, coming out um, of regulatory agencies that I think are really well intentioned and they're really trying to do the right thing, um, but they're going to amount to censorship in the US and then they're going to be picked up internationally um, and used as censorship internationally. And we're going to see the same things pop up in the Middle East, the same things pop up in Western Europe, Southeast Asia, where they tend to duplicate the things that are done in the United States as an international organization. We see this time and time again um, and all sorts of um, political speech are just going to get shut down in these other areas. Um, so we have real fear for how this can be used elsewhere once it's in place in the U.S., not to mention how it's going to be used in the U.S. Uh, hi, I'm Jenny Gebhardt uh, from the Electronic Frontier Foundation, uh, where I focus primarily on consumer privacy and security. Uh, I'm also, particularly for the interest of this panel, a trained librarian. Um, I have a master's in library science and information science. Um, and this issue is very dear to my heart, both as someone who works on libraries and as someone who works on security. Um, so I approach this from two different angles. First, kind of the librarian in me um, says that this is not a technology issue. Like Amy said, this has is, is existed long before any kind of technologies we're talking about. This is a media literacy or media readiness issue. Um, I say literacy with a question mark because I think more and more saying information literacy or media literacy can kind of be a slight at someone. If you tell someone like, hey, you're not media literate, that like could invoke a lot of shame or um, just kind of negative reactions that we don't want. I think all of us, it's, it's a process, right? And as we've seen with kind of the fake news quote unquote phenomenon um, and the number of people who clicked on clickbait this morning, including me, None of us are completely media literate. This is changing constantly and we need to keep up. And I think particularly um, librarians, calling on my own profession, um, educators and other spaces need to keep up as this changes. So I think in a big way, um, it's a media literacy issue both in, both in terms of posting, sharing, and propagating this kind of information as well as reading it and consuming it and how you do that. Um, I think in a big way, just labeling something fake news and walking away is not going to be the best approach. I think we need some kind of transformative 
um, transformative strategy here to transform that kind of information and to to move towards something that's a little more genuine, something that encompasses that range of content between kind of the clickbait, market-driven content, propaganda, um, and I think maybe the fantasy, right, of objective, fact-based, completely 100% truthful news. Um, even just recognizing that there can be many truths at one time and how do we deal with that from a legislative perspective, from someone who advocates to tech companies um, to take some responsibility and in various educational capacities. So that's the librarian side. Um, on, sec on the security side, um, something that I see talked about less but that really worries me. Um, is that I think even when we talk about you know Russian hacking, we talk a lot about hacking in this room, um, and threats and compromises and vulnerabilities. The number one most dangerous thing for most people in this room, and even for high-profile targets, is links that pretend to be something they're not. That is your number one security threat. Often we talk about that in terms of phishing. We talk about that in terms of malware. Um, I would argue that fake news, that's a great way to describe it. It's a link, it's a headline that is pretending to be something it's not. And often, um, the overlap, the Venn diagram between whatever we're calling fake news and sites that would like to track you or take advantage of you, there's a pretty big overlap there. Um, there are plenty of reputable news sites that would also like to track you. Um, so we're not letting anyone off the hook. Um, I mean, install Privacy Badger, visit The Economist, and let me know what you find. Um, but the overlap there of various ways on the internet to pretend to be something that you're not to get the user to click on it, that applies not only for phishing and malware, that applies for tracking, um, that applies for any kind of data brokering of your information that you might not want to share, and that also applies to trying to influence your mind and your actions and your opinions. Um, so I think that fake news, while I think security is not the top line issue there, um, it overlaps so much with tracking and privacy issues online. Um, so I'll be happy to talk about that more later. Turn it over to you. Thanks. Uh, hi, my name is Will Nevin. I am a JD PhD. I teach at the University of Alabama. I teach several journalism courses. I also work for Advanced Media, so I'm an educator and a practitioner. Um, I think the interesting thing for me in terms of fake news, and I just use air quotes under the table, so it's real helpful. Um, <laughs> but in asking some of my students, uh, my introduction to journalism courses, what is news? And then you know, we talked about that, and then eventually we sort of got into the discussion of what is fake news. Well, fake news is blah, 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 blah. And as well, I had one student that said, well, I think it, it can be news, right? Uh, and then I said, well, if fake news is news, then the game's over. <laughs> Let's quit and go home. Um, I think how we define fake news is very important because right now it is a term that I think at one time had a commonly understood definition, and now it is weaponized. Um, fake news is now anything you disagree with, and we, uh, we certainly can't continue to live in that world. So uh, I'm looking forward to an interesting discussion. Okay, now me. Uh, unlike pretty much everybody else here, I've got no law background. Uh, me neither. Oh. <laughs> All right, I was wrong. <laughs> All right. Um, I, for the last uh, 10 and a bit years, I've worked for torrentfreak.com, a technology news site based in the Netherlands, uh, focusing on peer-to-peer -peer systems. Uh, I've also written for a bunch of other news sites, including TechDirt, uh, and uh, I've also spent five years working as either the chairman or deputy chairman of uh, the US Pirate Party, and another year as the International Pirate Party uh, Coordinator. Um, I've been a subject of fake news stories and I've had to, and the organizations I've worked with have also been subject of uh, <laughs> fake news ac accusations. Um, so I've got some experience coming from the side of being the victim and being the target. So uh, I've got, if anyone wants to know more about that sort of thing and how to deal with that sort of thing is, is where, I, where I certainly come from there. And uh, look at that left in a minute. <laughs> okay, um, a recent poll from Pew says that about 62% of Americans get their news from social media. Um, another statistic uh, is that the top 20 fake news stories about the 2016 presidential election received more engagement on Facebook than the top 20 stories from the major news outlets. So what is the role, I would like to ask the panel, what is the role of private companies to police this type of behavior. Uh, Facebook has attempted, and they've removed some editors for selecting stories on their trending 
Uh, I'm not familiar with Facebook as well as I should be, uh, but I, I guess they have a trending section. Um, but they've tried to curate that essentially, uh, and then they removed some people who were uh, not doing it correctly, and they employed an algorithm. And then right after they did that, all the fake news stories went like almost to the top. So, uh, what can we do about it? Are, do private companies have a role in enforcing it, or should the government step in, or, or what? All hell are robot overlords. <laughs> yeah, I, can, I can jump in there. Um, the first point I want to make is that, I don't know if people are familiar with, yeah, Facebook has a trending news section. Um, they used to employ live, human, living, breathing curators, like journalists, librarians, people who do this for a living. Um, and then there was some controversy. People didn't like it, so they fired the humans and they brought in the robot overlords. I'd like to point out that an algorithm is created by also a living, breathing human that has biases, and that living, breathing human will inevitably code them in. Um, so I think it was seen or maybe hoped to be an improvement, like, hey, instead of these bias-riddled humans, we're gonna have this objective, shiny, chrome algorithm. Like, that just, that's a fallacy, and I think both, both are problematic in different ways, and I think maybe right now at this moment in time, it's much easier maybe to defend publicly and popularly the unbiased nature of an algorithm, but time and time again, it, just, it, doesn't, it doesn't hold up. Um, so yes, that was the thing that Facebook did. Um, I think that the hard part, for me at least grappling with this as someone who advocates to tech companies on these issues, um, Facebook has defended themselves as a tech company, like, hey, we're just a tech company. We're not a media company. We're not journalists. We're not curators. Um, and I agree, they're not journalists or curators, but the second they went from a fire hose live time news, um, news feed to a curated algorithm driven news feed, they became a media company, whether they like it or not. Um, I think the hard thing is, to try to prescribe to Facebook um, what precisely they should do. Um, I say this often on panels, but I mean, if we had an answer, we could all just go home right now. Um, I think that their immediate reaction to fake news kind of right after the election, they took some steps um, people may have seen in their news feeds. Um, sometimes a banner showed up above an article that said like, this is contested, click here to learn more. They had some links out to Snopes. Um, but even that, um, I interpret it at least and others in the field to be kind of Facebook solving the problem of not being seen to be doing anything. So they did something. Um, but particularly the banner that says like, hey, this article is contested, click here to learn more. Um, that can embolden people. And in fact, we have science this, there are papers, it does embolden people, say, hey, who are you to tell me? Are you telling me I'm stupid? And then really to double down perhaps on the view that they have, um, which may indeed, according to the banner, be contested um, or be problematic or be propaganda. So trying to kind of wrap people over the knuckles for clicking on something or before they click on something, um, that often does not achieve an educational aim. Um, it, 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 it backfires in a huge way. Um, yeah, and I guess I'll let people talk more before I even dare to say what Facebook should do. But I think because they are now a curating media company, they do have responsibility. The answer is yes there, for sure. So I'm gonna disagree a little bit. Um, because So fake news is just the most recent excuse being used by governments to try to get Facebook to start taking down content. Um, it has mostly come up the last five years in a world um, of countering violent extremism. Do you guys, have you heard of that term? Yeah, maybe a little bit. Mm -hmm. There's some there's some nods. There's I, I think there's a guy here who knows a lot about it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and and hate speech. So in in the CVE countering violent extremism and hate speech world, um, a lot of governments, many of them in Europe, have been pushing companies to start taking down more and more content that they deem objectionable. Some of that is I think content that people who have any sort of moral compass would l absolutely like to see taken down. Um, some of it actually is material that should be explored and researched, and some of it is actually being posted by researchers and academics um, to do their jobs. Um, it's not being used as um, by terrorist networks to recruit necessarily, but it's being kind of lumped in. It's a very, very subjective world. Um, I, for one, am not comfortable with Facebook trying to make judgment calls on what content I can and cannot post um, by calling it either hate speech or CVE content or violent extremist content or fake news. Yeah. 
To be, to be clear, I was not advocating for taking stuff down. There's a difference between curating and censorship, and I think that's a line we shouldn't cross. That, that said, I, I, think think Facebook, yeah. I think Facebook is doing some really interesting things with yeah. deprioritizing content that is clearly fake, so it's not showing up at the top of news feeds. So it's still there, it's still presentable, yeah. you can still share it, um, but it's not going to be the first thing you see when you log in. Um, I think it's quite interesting. They are trying to figure out how to have that flagged as fake news. Um, and from what I understand, you can flag something as fake. Um, anybody can flag anything as fake now. The number of posts that get flagged as fake is quite high. The number of posts that actually kind of leave the pack and like exponentially receive that flag, um, there are very few of them, which is, I think is really fascinating. Um, Facebook released a really fascinating technical paper um, that's probably just about at my level of what I understand from a technical perspective. So it might be above what some people understand. It might be below what some people understand. Um, but it, it kind of rides the medium level of tech understanding to be able to figure it out about what they're doing on this. Um, and I am, I'm f not thinking that they've done everything they can do, but I'm fairly comfortable with the more hands-off approach they've taken of not taking down content trying to let researchers and people share, not kind of bowing down to governments. Now, that said, I'm really uncomfortable with their interactions with Europe. And the fact that Europe is, is on pressure of regulation, really pushing them in a way that is getting them to take down more content in these other spaces. Um, and the increase of pushing for them to take down content in fake news is driving more justifications for them to take down what they think of as hate speech and CVE content, which is going to be an increasing problem. Um, I think we're going to continue to see governments trying to regulate that space. They're trying to end run around transparency processes instead of going through and like filing a government notice to take down content. They're filing a notice saying this is a terms of service violation. Please take this down. You can't host it which means we're not getting the adequate transparency into how often governments want content to come down off Facebook, which I think is really malicious yeah. um, from a government perspective. Um, so I, I think when you start getting into Facebook making these object subjective decisions, I get really uncomfortable. I don't, want a pri I don't want private companies generally dictating, but there are things they can do. So I can't speak a lot to the, the tech question, but I will say that I think recognizing fake news can be quite difficult. Um, at least if you're not looking at it with a really discerning eye. And I'll give you an example. So uh, an entertainer I follow on Twitter uh, posted what he thought was a funny story, and it is a funny story, uh, from countyweekly.com. And I invite you to all whip out your supercomputers and go to countyweekly.com. And what you'll find there is something that looks a lot like a news website. It has stories, it has pictures. I think North Korea is, uh, is a top story and you know, they have different sections and they claim to be a local news site. And you start reading and you start thinking and you realize that there are no sources here. Uh, some of these stories are implausible, like the story that my entertainer friend shared about how um, a man and his wife discovered each other uh, because the man had hired a prostitute and his wife was <laughs> hiring herself out as a prostitute. Um, and so that was, uh, I know, right? It, that doesn't make any sense. And it's, in essence, fiction. And, but again, it looks so much like a real news website. And so I think the ultimate solution is, uh, going back to what you were saying, the question of media literacy. And in the last panel I was on Friday, I suggested that we need to teach that in schools as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. Because trying to teach someone on Facebook, no, this is, this is not a real news website, this is not a real story, it is fiction. Um, if, if you're trying to do that at 15 or 20 or 30 or 40 or 60 or 70, it's too late. That, that skill is not going to develop overnight. So again, uh, I. I, like I said, I don't know what Facebook can do, but I think as educators, uh, it's something we need to work on. Okay. Fake news is essentially hacking. We all know that. If you've been to Hacking 101, you've heard uh, Johnny X talk about social engineering. That's what fake news is. It's socially engineering somebody to manipulate them in a way to behave the way that's desired. 
so it's going to be a really hard way to undo what is basic human nature. I think so. I'm, I, I worry that fake news has is, is always been here. We, we said that Friday. It's always going to be here. So we're not going to get rid of it. We just got to learn to recognize it, as you say. So what we can do is perhaps deal with our own, how to put it, um, egocentric natures. I mean, Dunning-Kruger effect is, is a perfect example. A lot of us think we know more about something than we do, and that helps us to be engineered. So perhaps we should all stop thinking we know so much. As a society, I don't mean individually in the role conceited, uh, but that if we all had a little more humility and I'd admit that we don't know things and be a little more critical in our thinking and not assume that everything that matches what we already thought, yep, that must be right because I thought that. That, I think, is perhaps the best thing, way to deal with it of all, but it will require a huge paradigm shift of basically what our society has become. So. Until that happens, I don't think fake news will be dealt with in any way by Facebook, by Twitter, by Google, by any technological conglomerate, any entity, any government, because it's going to require that fundamental human emotional shift to, to be solved. Yeah. Also, uh, off of what you're saying, Ed, briefly, um, I'm a firm believer in the fact that we can't tech ourselves out of a problem we didn't tech ourselves into. Um, I think as you guys have so eloquently pointed out, um, this has been around forever, as long as there's been communication. Uh, it's not going to go away. Um, so in so many, so many ways, these more holistic, transformative approaches are a huge piece of the puzzle. So I think Facebook has a responsibility, but that's not the cure. That's not the solution. Um, it's going to be so much more multifaceted than that. I'll be curious to know um, the panel's thoughts on the weaponization of fake news. Um, in my own, my own research, uh, I've come across a lot of instances where governments will use it uh, just based on the effect that it has on on people, and they use it for political reasons. And I I, I tend to be a little more political than Amy, <laughs> but uh, so I have very strong views about you know which side uses it more in what manner. Um, but I'd be very interested in hearing from the panel what they think about the weaponization of it. Um, we've talked a little bit about the fake news stories that are just for, for clicks and revenue. But I would like to touch a little bit on, you know, who's out there using these stories and, and, and promoting them, and for what purpose? Mm. Me, me first? Or the <laughs> okay. Who's using them for what purpose? Anybody who's greedy is using them. For whatever purpose? It's to do whatever they want to do with them. It's, again, human engineering, it's manipulation of people, it's the same way any con man does any con, it's to, it's to, to gain. Um, I've been, as I've been the target at uh, Torrent Freak a few years back, we, we published um, about the, the net neutrality battle, as many, many of you heard about the net neutrality battle, uh, what sparked the huge swings between it was uh, 10 years ago, uh, I caught and then the EFF and Associated Press verified that Comcast was forging uh, RST packets to, uh, to people using BitTorrent and basically telling each side that the other had dropped the connection. When we published it, they said, no, that's fake news. That's fake news. They're lying. They're making it up. It's a lie. And then we, got a we found a memo that said, yeah, we're doing this, but don't tell anybody. Tell them it's fake news, that they're just making it up. And that it took a while until that memo came out and that they were exposed. They'd been propping themselves up with fake news to, to hide the greater lie. And then things went bad for them because in this instance, someone paid attention. And it was only through the likes of the EFF and the Associated Press that got the FCC's attention mm -hmm. into it. And now we've got the comments and the latest consultation, and that's even more fake news. And part of the reason I seem so logy and a bit groggy is that before can before can I spent uh, a, a basically most of a day writing a response comment on the closing day, the thirtieth, uh, dealing with as many of those fake comments as, and which were effectively fake news to Chairman Pai that I could. 
and I was I must have bashed out I don't know how many pages, but they were all fake news. It was, uh, collectively, the ones I responded to were something like 1.3 million comments, all fake, all many with forged uh, names and addresses put to them, including some people I knew personally. I, I live in a town of 10,000, and there are over a thousand people who submitted comments. I don't think one in ten people in my rural, nowhere town in in middle Georgia submitted comments to the FCC saying, yes, we want you to get rid of Title II and bring back a free and open internet with light touch regulation. <laughs> most, of the, most of the people where I live, if you talk about light touch, you ain't talking about regulation. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's that kind of fake news that, that, that is in places where you wouldn't actually expect. You think too much about... It, it, people often think, you know, Facebook and stuff, but it's also in the interactions in government. Um, another fake news story that always gets me is, I think it was Senator Orrin Hatch about 18 months ago said, look, we know climate change is, is, is a hoax because, look, here's a snowball in my hand. It snowed yesterday or today. Using, again, fake news to push a, push a, uh, uh, a thing, uh, uh, an agenda uh, to push a con. So that's what I think is used <laughs> on how and why. I just I want to. I always feel some sort of caution when people start using words like war and weaponization and army to describe things that are not war or weapons or armies. Not that it's wrong. In fact, we published a blog post on troll armies, and I think that's the term that people use for it. Um, but I think it pushes us in a term where we need a military response to things. Um, and I think normally the best response to speech is speech um, and not military. Um, misinformation is a problem. Um, I, just, I, I caution with the, the ideas of putting it into this military war-driven context because people are in war, people are dying, people are getting shot every single day. Um, it's not happening on the internet. There are other issues that are real issues happening on the internet and we should deal with them as issues happening on the internet. Um, yeah, two things come to mind with a question about, yeah, the weaponizing, again, quote unquote, a fake news. Um, yeah, I agree. In so much of InfoSec and in terms of media, even like we talk about threat models and adversaries. It's like we could also talk about risk assessments and people you're worried about. Um, so I absolutely agree that choosing our terms carefully is really important here, especially as we talk about solutions and responses. Um, another term that librarian here I care a lot about, misinformation versus disinformation. They are two hugely, hugely different things. Misinformation is a mistake. Um, it's something that would require a correction or a redaction. Um, misinformation, it happens all the time. We make mistakes. Uh, we get things wrong. We might exaggerate. Exaggeration might be misinformation. Disinformation is deceitful. Disinformation is when we get into social engineering and people trying to manipulate you into doing something, you know, taking your attention, taking your money, taking your action or vote or something that they want. Um, and so the second thing there that I thought of, in, in addition to mis versus disinformation, which you could honestly spend your whole life studying. I know some people who do. Um, the other thing is that fake news itself, when we ask kind of, you know, who is using it or utilizing it and why, um, I realize that the answer to that question is so broad because fake news has become, I think as we've all alluded to, it's kind of become a tofu term, just kind of like taking on the flavor of whatever you choose to put around it, um, which is where these discussions just get bigger and bigger and vaguer until, you know, we need media literacy armies or something like that. Um, I think in these conversations, it's also always so important um, to answer that question first of who is using this and why, and then we can use maybe more precise terms that, you know, this is propaganda. That is not new. That's not sexy and sensational like fake news might be. You know, this is clickbait. This is a troll farm. Um, and when we can drill down like that, I think then it goes from kind of this big, more hand-waving discussion into something much more focused on what is the problem and what are the reasonable responses that we can muster. I think a good, uh, simple thing to keep in mind is that fake news requires intent. There is some intent somewhere, whereas misinformation is a simple, or can be a simple mistake that is uh, theoretically corrected with a retraction or a correction. Such as when I, I mistakenly <laughs> said earlier that everybody else was had a <laughs> law background. That was a misinformation. <laughs> Yes. 
Um, I, w I heard on Friday in another panel, uh, in another room, um, that they have this uh, possibility of, uh, of uh, uh, th they're actually lying. I think there's a Russian term for it, but they're lying to you. They know you know they're lying, and, and they still keep lying to you. Real politics? <laughs> no, no, it, you know, beyond, they actually think you, they think trying to convince you. They aren't even trying to convince you. What, what, how is that affecting some of these things? Because I, I, I literally can't understand some of these crazy stories, but I think that's part of the game, right? Is it to wipe out the other, maybe blot other things out or change your opinions? What's your feelings, We've especially when you hear from a library science it. person? <laughs> um, but, you know, this idea of just, is it, why, why do they do, uh, this is a Russian term, so it must have been Russian propaganda. What, <laughs> what are the effects of this, or why are people doing that? How, how could that be effective? I don't, nobody have any. I don't really have any. So Let me see if I can look over okay. them. I, I don't know. So uh, well, let's think about some of the popular. so fake that they can't, no one would possibly ever believe them. How, how, would, how could that be effective? In yeah, well, let's think of some of the, like, the popular Twitter feeds in the age of resistance. Um, Louise Minch, right? Uh, um, uh, yeah. Uh, she basically posts political fan fiction. Um, talking about Supreme Court marshals and indictments and uh, impeachments and, and it, it's 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 nonsense. Um, but she has built a personal brand of nonsense and her political fan fiction. And I think I think that that speaks to a lot of it as far as individuals online sharing those sorts of stories. It is I am building a reputation for nonsense. And at the end of the day. Uh, I suppose there's mon monetization at the end of it. I, I, I can't think of why else <laughs> she particularly does what she does. Uh, I can also add, I, I don't know about the specific example um, you're thinking of, but just the, indeed the idea of kind of like farcical absurdity in the public sphere of like, no one, and you know I don't believe this and yet you keep saying it. Um, I think that's kind of a, a time-tested signal to noise tactic, maybe to distract attention away from something else. Um, current administration is expert at this. They did not invent it. Um, I do a lot of work in Southeast Asia where military dictatorships there have been practicing the first cool news conference for much longer than we have. Um, I think so much of it is really injecting a lot of noise into the system, making it harder to detect you know, what is indeed valid or not. Um, I think it's you see so often um, dismissing governments, not, not our own necessarily, but saying like, oh, you know, they're incompetent. They don't know what they're doing. But that's actually to get you to think that, someone had to know what they were doing um, to have that kind of distraction, I think. So distraction could be, depending on the example, one, one purpose of that. I, I think that also, you'd be surprised, maybe you wouldn't be surprised, but I think that the people who, who promulgate those stories, uh, there are a lot of people who actually follow those stories. And even if, even if a lot of the story is not true, sometimes there'll be like a grain in there that grabs them, and it'll feed this like mistrust. And so like with this, again, I don't mean to get too political, but with this recent presidential election, I see sort of a big movement of just about a distrust in general. So the conspiracy theory sort of mindset, and you could have a whole entire panel just on conspiracy theories, you know, from 9-11 to lithium in our water supply, the food industry poisoning us, on and on and on and on and on and on. Dear God. And <laughs> There's a question. And, yeah, the answer is... is uh, no. no. Russian. Shush, Russian. Russian. Shush. Yeah. I'm, I'm probably mispronouncing it, but I think it's Verano, and uh, it was basically what oh. you just said, where they put out something that's just blatantly false, and, and you know, that nobody even really believes it. But uh, I think we may have been to the same panel, but the, the aim of this is it's not an immediate effect. It's something, what they're, what they're trying to do is erase the truth over time because knowledge is passed down imperfectly from one generation to the next, kind of like that telephone game where you know something gets across the room and it's changed a little bit, but if somebody's deliberately trying to break that signal and put something in there that wasn't there before, then you, you know, after a while, you can convince people that something happened that never happened or that something didn't happen when it did happen. What was the uh, term again? Could you say it, please? Uh, I, I'm probably pr mispronouncing it, but I think it's Verano. Hmm. It's a psychological technique, essentially. Great. Thank you for that. Yeah. Okay. One of the questions or kind of comes to my mind about this is it's seeming almost Orwellian in the sense of we're going to put out the stuff out there, drown out the facts. 
you know, put in the hooks to drive people to fake news stories and keep kind of that churn on that and basically be able to, you know, do whatever the heck they want to do because no one believes that they're doing it, even if they're found out, and no one knows what they're doing if they're not. And that kind of seems like a across the board, all of the, you know, governmental agencies and the, you know, the tech companies and all that are, you know, seem to be driving towards that. It's, you know, kind of a disheartening uh, thought. You, you guys can, you know, maybe cheer me up and <laughs> disprove some of that. <laughs> well, I, I think you can choose right now, and I'll speak just to the current political environment here in the United States, the current media landscape. You can choose to think that, A, there is a... <laughs> Uh, master grand design behind all of this, behind a, this misinformation campaign, this disinformation campaign, this total chaos uh, that is seen in the uh, current administration, or you can just think that it's just a bunch of political novices who don't really know what they're doing. Uh, so one says it's a grand dark conspiracy, which implies that they have some control. If you like control, maybe that's a nice way to look at it. Or that this is just a passing thing that uh, our media and our government will eventually return to a stable state. Uh, so I don't really know which one I, I believe, but I, I tend not to subscribe to the 4D chess uh, mindset in that, in that I, I don't really think that a lot of these moves are made um, to sort of sow this idea of, you know, we can't really understand what a fact is anymore. Uh, I think it's... Sh political decisions made for short-term gains. Uh, and that's, that's ten the way I tend to look at it. But um, um, I don't know which one of those is more hopeful. <laughs> hey, uh, I have a couple of questions. One aimed to William and one a uh, to Amy. And the first one is that, um, so as a growing up, we know that the news used to be presented from a third person's perspective with a, a strong effort to not uh, reflect one's opinion while news is being presented. So with that as a background, the question to William is that um, how much conscious effort do you think the journalistic society put to identify and differentiate between news, information, and opinion? And, and how much effort is really invested in training individuals, not just, to, not just in training, but also in, in doing their practice to stick to that opinion. And to, to you, Amy, is that though I totally agree that we cannot, put a we cannot identify the line differentiating when making laws and legislations on this aspect, we should be able to enforce laws and uh, legislations to make these new entities, whatever they, be, they may be, to mark which ones is news, or which ones is the opinion, and which ones are uh, is just the information that they present? That that should be possible, right? That's not that hard. I'll you first. Go. Okay. Um, what is news and what what is news and what is opinion? I, I think that Jenny said it. Like everything is opinion. <laughs> Um, I don't. I don't know the last time I read a story that wasn't written with some sort of editorial bend on it. Unfortunately, there is a fictional world that I kind of presented on this end of the spectrum of the pure fact-driven, 100% no editorial story. And maybe we get that sometimes with like weather or sports scores. Like this team scored a touchdown at this time in this <laughs> inning. I don't. Maybe there is no <laughs> opinion in that. Maybe there is. Yeah, I know. My team was the team that got lo that lost. So I feel I feel this very dearly. Um, but everything I think is driven by opinion. Um, I do think that journalists, to the extent that there are journalists who have ethics rules, do try to identify in stories where there is fact and when there is opinion. Um, any rules that require them to do that, I don't know what those would possibly look like or how they'd be enforced. You would get the same people who are already trying to do the right thing and trying to like lay the facts and the opinions out, doing that still, and the people who aren't are just not going to comply with that 
anyway. Um, and so there, I think there's a problem of enforcement. Um, so I think a, there's a definitional problem of like the fact that most things are opinion driven to some extent that we read. And B, there's a problem of enforcement of how do you get the entities that aren't trying right now or are trying or are trying right now to pass their opinions off as fact to comply with even new rules that say they can't do that anymore. Um, I don't know if that will ever happen. Uh, and I'll, I'll answer your question for me. I think there are strong ethical norms in traditional mainstream journalism that help um, separate news and opinion. And it's interesting that you bring up the topic of information. Um, I, I talk to my students about information uh, being filtered into news. And the process that we create journalism, it, we bring our inherent bias to that. Um, and I tell my students, there's sure, there's no, nothing we know that is totally unbiased journalism. But we can act responsibly as journalists. We can act ethically with sources. We can act e ethically with editing. And I think there are a lot of good journalists doing good work out there. Um, but again, it's incumbent on the readers to go to sources that can be trusted. And I think that's the problem. Uh, <clears throat> first off, I love that idiom tofu term. I'm going to have to use that later. <laughs> that is fantastic. Uh, second, you mentioned uh, FCC comments as a source of fake news earlier, and I'm aware of uh, the, the myriad of counterfeit comments and the fake addresses that came through with that, but I never really thought about that as sort of a fake news paradigm. Can you mention some other common places that we encounter where there might be fake news, but we might not necessarily see it that way? Oh, right. <laughs> Maybe it'll have to be Friday, but uh, no. Uh, um, there's a there's a guy probably most of us know called Ken White, who's a famous First Amendment journalist who runs a site called Popat, and there's another couple of people who write on it too, and they have a Twitter feed, and it's called uh, the the DPRK News Service, and you will not believe how many reputable news agencies fall for the tweets they put on it and repeat the things as actual pro pro uh, pronunciations from the DPRK. Um, and that's where sometimes we get fake news. There was also, a, I seem to vaguely recall in this weird mishmash haze of, of, of pre-con prep that I saw, I think it was a New York Times article this la last week about how a story can become uh, from a fake thing to a real thing using quotes and, and switching from various media to media to media. So there was something about a, a, j a jet passing over a, a Navy ship and it turned into, in one version, it turned into a something else and then a, a fake Navy, a, a quote from an admiral was added to it from a different format and then added more. It can be in, in like jigsaw, so fake news can come to you from several several different places at once that seem interconnected until it actually suddenly mashes together to form you know a fake news block so there is no can always be you know you know you get an individual thing and then all of a sudden it weaves into this one perfect um thing of and that just to that point yeah. there's was a wonderful take by vox um, and motherboard, totally separate from each other, but the articles have to be read together about the Pizzagate story, which I felt very close to because it ended up with a person in my city taking a gun into a family-owned pizza place. Um, and so that was something that really touched home for a bunch of people in DC. And they were able to track the development of that story um, from its very first iteration as like a Facebook post. Um, to being picked up by somebody, to being picked up by somebody else, to becoming a news story, all the way through. And it's really fascinating to see that progression um, and how that happens and how it's a game of telephone almost, where one person picks something up and something that you would <coughs> never think of as fake news in a standalone, it's like an opinion written on a Facebook page, becomes passed off five stages down as absolute fact. It's so fascinating. So what was Pizzagate? Oh, oh what? <laughs> Why? Well, want people don't know, but it was—it's an insane Does somebody story. Somebody in the audience yeah. want to explain this? You get 45 yeah. seconds. 
All right. Um, starting with, so com there's Comets Pizza in Washington D.C. Um, John Podesta, which is Hillary Clinton's campaign manager, who also worked for President Barack Obama, ex-president, whatever. Um, Comets Pizza. They have this underground ping pong arena where they essentially ran this underground child sex ring, um, and they're all like apparently they're all pedophiles. And Pizzagate involves um, in WikiLeaks. There's these emails that use code words like hot dog and ice cream and pizza, and it stands for different things like kids or brown kid or white kid. So that's essentially what pizza it is. There's, for example, an email in John Podesta emails yeah. that say, that hot dog stand yeah, looks really right. good right now. And it's because John Podesta made a one-off comment at some point about if he didn't do what he was doing, he would own a hot dog stand in Hawaii. Um, but that was interpreted to mean like I'm requesting a certain child from this pizza place in DC. Um, it was supposedly run out of the basement. Um, the place is called Comic Ping Pong. The guy who eventually walked in with a gun to the pizza restaurant um, found out that Comic Ping Pong does not have a basement. Um, it doesn't exist. Unfortunately, nobody got hurt in that episode. Yeah. Um, but he was investigating this story that he had heard about this um, child exploitation ring, and it led to actual um, physical threats of violence, um, that, which that's is a fascinating. That's a good example, too, because that one in particular was uh, promoted by Alex Jones, and he was <laughs> ranting and ranting and ranting about it. He even said that he might himself go over there and expose it because he has to see it firsthand. And so you get a certain percentage of the population who are like, you know, screw that, I'm going to go down there myself and find out. And so it instigates things, it can lead to action like that. So, And, and we touched on this Friday, this, that's not the first time something like that's going to happen. True. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I'd like to ask the panel, um, given, can social medias and tech companies, what advice would you give them to combat fake news or to protect users against fake news? If you had to give them advice, what would you give them? If I had to, which my job description sometimes says I do, um, <laughs> if I absolutely had to give them advice, um, I think the short version is use your global platform for good. Um, use your global platform as perhaps a megaphone for some kind of media literacy content initiative. I don't know what. Um, not to confuse Facebook with educators with one-on-one -on -one education in smaller groups. Um, but I think there have to be so many opportunities um, for global social media platforms to do that. Um, I said that once uh, to a group of colleagues and I got laughed off. And a couple weeks later, Facebook kind of did. Um, they released like a media literacy section of the site. It was nice. There were lovely cartoons. I was like, hey, great. This is not a solution. Um, it, it, it absolutely won't be. But if we can add another piece of that puzzle, just any kind of small um, small ways to expose people perhaps to not just ideas but to media literacy strategies that they hadn't thought of before. Um, sometimes ooh, sometimes I feel naive even suggesting that, uh, but I have to believe that, that if you know done well with consultation with educators, librarians, members of different communities, I have to believe that that is done well. It is better than silence. Um, it's better than wrapping people on the knuckles and telling them to go to Snopes um, when they see content from a trusted source like a friend. Um, I. That would be my one piece of advice if I had to. <laughs> I think my one comment uh, would be to give people the option to mark stuff as fake news. So you have like the like button and the dislike button, but if you see an article that has like 500 people marking it as fake news, you might be cautious. I think that would be sort of a self-governing way to do it. Mm, um, company, really. It's hard for companies to curate all the... So once again. upon a time, Google had objective <laughs> search results. You put in a term, you got objective search results. Following that, Google changed it, and it gave you subjective results they thought you wanted to see. But if you looked, there was this little icon in yeah. the top right-hand corner, and it showed people or a globe. And you could click on the globe, and you could go back towards your objective search results if you really wanted to. That option has now totally gone away. Um, unless you're totally signed out of Google or using a different browser, you always get subjective search results, and you have no option not to. Um, this is my allegory for the internet and social media. They have moved us to a world where they are showing us without option only content they think we want to see, and they are reinforcing our worldviews. And my recommendation would be for social media to put a lot more effort into challenging our worldviews um, 
and encouraging less toxic interactions of people with one another um, in disagreements. You should be able to disagree with people online. And to that end, I have actually personally started promoting the content of friends in my social media feeds who I really disagree with um, to try to at least see what they're posting and engaging in more productive conversations. It is my, in my personal life, one little way of contributing to this, and I think that there should be studies going into that. There are other search engines besides Google, too, so I would encourage people to try the alternatives out Duck, there. DuckDuckGo. Use DuckDuckGo. Duck, 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 yes. Yeah. <laughs> so on one end of the spectrum, you have Alex Jones, who says wildly crazy things that are Th there's no way there's that they're true. Then on the other end of the spectrum, you have, in the last, we'll say, two years, the our current commander in chief has said these outrageous claims, but then had talking heads go on cable news shows to basically explain away, oh, he really meant this believable thing. So, n f first, do you believe that there has been a blurring of the line between? it's not true and uh, he didn't really mean that <coughs> and how dangerous do you believe that blurring of the line is? I think there are a lot of dangerous things coming out of the White House right now and I'm not afraid to say it. Yay! Yay! Sorry. I think one of them is Ain't the fact political. that <laughs> I have heard people vehemently defend Trump's statement saying not only his people, normal people saying we don't expect him to actually mean what he says. We know what he means. We know what he actually is saying, even if it's factually untrue. I do think that's dangerous. I think that we are in a dangerous, on a dangerous path as a country. I think that what is going on right now is making this a more dangerous country to live in. And I have real fears for what it means in the future. Um, one thing that I became a little bit concerned about in the last election cycle was people's insatiable, the developing of people's insatiable appetite for news. And I'm a, I've become a little bit concerned about what happens when the political climate normalizes and when we go back to business as normal, normal boring politics that doesn't get reported on every single day by every single news outlet from every single angle, 24 hours a day. Like, are we going to start to see these companies that have built their revenue model around getting people to click on their links? When the news starts to dry up, what starts to happen to the news climate then? I, I see Katetcher shaking his head <laughs> grimly. But, but I'll say, uh, let's, let's try to imagine a world uh, four, eight years from now in which we're just reporting on policy again. <laughs> I, I like your optimism, uh, but uh, let's imagine a big, you know, health care bill, and and the, they're just reporting on policy, not the the incompetent machinations of the those who want to change the policy. They're just reporting on the substance. Now, the reporting is going to be sensationalized. It's going to be devoted to whatever incremental news there is of the day. But that's what we're going to see more of, I think. Um, instead of, it seems like now, 15 different huge things are happening all at once. When that quiets down, when you have a more traditional administration in office, I think, I think it'll get a little bit back to normal, but you, know, you might see some changes. <laughs> Trying to think positive here. I'm just real quick as you turn it back on, I think that there's a really long discussion to be had about what truth is now um, and what is fake and what is real. I don't think that we're going to be able to do that in the next 120 <laughs> seconds, but that is a its own conversation separate from fake news is what is truth. Oh, I've got 20 go, seconds. Go, go, go. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> My question is, is there any way to make, like, you know, the factual story, like, you know, every story that, get, that gets released gets sensationalized in some way. Is there any way to make the facts sexy again? Like, you know, I, it's like, um, what I'm thinking of is the Facebook bot, like, you know, bot scandal. Everyone believes that the bots were shut down because they were developing their own language when they just weren't following their programming. Um, but it's really sexy to, like, click on a link um, and inspire fear about, like, you know, suddenly the robots, like, you know, are acting outside of human control. 
Always how do you make how do you, how do you, how do you, how do you, how do you make how do you make the real how do you make the real story sexy again so that people actually click on it, actually learn, and they're not I, I, driven by fear or. I, there's, a, there's, a, there's a line from from Fracture. Yeah. I love it. A lie can be around the world before the truth has got its boots on. A lie always appeals to somebody's vanities, the, the things. The truth is uncomfortable and to most people uncomfortable uncomfortability is not something they want so yeah, it's not going to be possible really I'll add um, yeah I like that we're wrapping up with questions about truth and facts right because I think there's a very strong argument that they do not exist they are fantasies um, the aims you know in journalism in librarianship in the work that we do in advocacy the ethical aim is for this, this bias and this objectivity. Um, but I think the ethical work is in recognizing that those don't exist. They are things we aim for. And like you said, we can be responsible in our pursuit of those goals. Um, but I think part of the conversation of you know, what is truth when we ask, like, can we market maybe? Or can we write about facts in such a way that they become popular, that they drive the agenda? Um, I think one of the ways to do that is to recognize that there is no one version of truth that we need to regulate towards. Um, I think that is the Orwellian future that I fear. Um, that there is one version of the true story and we are going to stick with that one because it is objective and it is fact-based. Um, I think it's more true that there's a diversity of truths and the challenge is really in finding a conversation among those um, rather than an echo chamber. So I mean, I love Amy's idea um, that Facebook could scale up of instead of sharing one thing, let's share two that share opposing views and see them in conversation. Um, so maybe I'm giving an even more boring answer, right, to your question that the truth lies in conversation. But I think that is the much, the harder, right, and more uncomfortable reality to, to work towards in some way. I, I was going to add, oh, go ahead. Oh, <laughs> add real quick, um, I like the idea of interviewing the big head honchos of all these new or news organizations. So maybe if Fox News would interview some of the M MSNBC people, <laughs> MSNBC people would interview them. I know Megyn Kelly had Alex Jones on. You know, he, he is the leader of, of his station. So I think, you know, you know, more speech, like Amy mentions, you know, giving, even though we disagree with them, we can demonize them, giving them a chance uh, to come on and uh, make sure the interview is fair, uh, but making it in the public. I think that might be one strategy to uh, uh, let other people ultimately decide the truth. For I would love to get back to where we don't expect the news to be sexy. <laughs> um, where we are willing to read something because it's important and it matters and we don't have to jazz it up with a bunch of like hyperbole that is making it hard to figure out what is real. <laughs>